from John 14, which can be found on 1082, and I'm reading from 23 to 29. Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will, will love him, and he will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. Those words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the counselors, the Holy Spirits, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will, remain, will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I will not give you, I will not give it to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. You hear me say, I am going away, and I am coming back to you. If you love me, you will be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now, before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. Here endeth the reading. Thanks be to God. Amen. So Paul's now going to open up the word, so I'll just say a prayer for Paul. Lord God, we just thank you for your son Paul here today to open up the word for us. We ask that our hearts are open to all he has to say to us and that your word will be with us for the rest of this day and the rest of this week, Lord. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Lovely to be back again. And that was actually far more than I was expecting. I was told to have half a dozen, so it's rather <laughs> wonderful to see so many of you here, despite those that and we are, of course, thinking of those members who are away on the weekend. From verse 23, the opening verse of today's gospel, Jesus says, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. But what is this teaching Jesus wants us to obey? Well, just a few verses earlier in the same chapter of John, Jesus says that he wants us to keep his commandments. And those commandments are quite simply to love God and love one another, love one's neighbor. A story is told of a mother telling her six-year-old son about the golden rule. Always remember, she said, that we are here to help others. The lad pondered, paused for thought as only six-year-olds can and then responded by saying, well, what are the others for then? The child was right, of course, to pose the question, for it is all too easy to divide the world into givers and receivers. I wouldn't mind betting that most of us here this morning, if asked whether we were a giver or a receiver, would probably answer the former, we are givers. But in reality, we are in both camps. We are here to love God and to love our neighbor, but we're also here to be loved by God and to be loved by our neighbor. But who is my neighbor? The commandment Jesus of Jesus, which is at the heart of the, of the message of John's gospel, orders us to take God seriously, and that in turn implies that we take the world seriously. The two cannot be separated. In his gospel, John links together faith and ethics in the closest possible way. We must confess Jesus as Son of God, because this is to recognize the way God has loved us. He sent his Son to us to revive the link between him and us, despite the likely consequences of so doing. But in order to live in God, we must abide in love with everyone else. As I said, though, who is everyone else? Who is my neighbor? It would be so easy for us if Christianity clearly defined limits told us precisely who is my neighbor and who isn't. But the reality is that there are no limits. The love of Jesus knew no limits. He cared for the poor, the sick, the exploiter, and the exploited. He ate meals in hovels. He dined in mansions. There was no limited liability. There was no discrimination. As the late Bishop John V. Taylor wrote, 
He noticed the unnoticed. He empowered the powerless. And he put in touch the out of touch. The parable that Jesus told to illustrate this point was the story of the rich man Lazarus. And Lazarus, I'm sure you remember it. Lazarus was a poor beggar who lay at the gate of the rich man's castle. They both died at about the same time. Lazarus went to heaven, but the rich man went to hell. The mistake that the rich man had made was not that he had deliberately ignored Lazarus. No, it was that he just hadn't noticed him. He did not recognize his neighbor. He accepted the social order without question. Now you might say, oh well, thank goodness, that's long since gone. Things are not like that now. Well, aren't they? It really is not very long ago that when singing that old favorite hymn, All Things Bright and Beautiful, we used to sing the rich man in his castle, the poor man at his gate. He made them high and lowly and ordered their estate. Words that completely contradict the teaching of Jesus. Thank goodness those words have been deleted in the new hymn books we now use. And of course, in society in general, there is a considerable lack of understanding as to who is my neighbor. There cannot be anyone here in church today who didn't shudder, if they remember the, the occasion, at a tot and totally deplore the election of someone representing the British National Party to local government a few years back. The man elected had made it totally clear that he wanted to see a large proportion of his neighbors deported people who have every bit as much right to live there as he does, but merely have differing colored skins. Yes, there are terrible problems in parts of our land. There is much deprivation and a real lack of suitable housing. Life for many is tougher than we can possibly imagine. But racial discrimination cannot, must not be the answer. We as a nation have rightly been quick to denounce other parts of the world where there is racial disharmony. We must, however, make sure that such discrimination does not occur in our land. But it is so easy for scapegoats to be sought when things are wrong. Bishop David Shepherd, the previous Bishop of Liverpool, spoke a few years ago of the comfortable Britain and what it's like to belong to the other Britain. There are whole communities in the latter group which he, he called the left behind and socially disadvantaged because the strongest members have moved away. They suffer the poorest service in terms of housing, healthcare, transport, education, and leisure facilities. And of course, overseas in the third world, it is even worse. Not surprisingly then, in such situations, fanatical groups flourish. It is to such communities that we must demonstrate that anyone who loves God loves his neighbor as well for love includes the excluded. It's an enormous task, totally daunting. What can I possibly do in the face of so much deprivation? I was reading yesterday that someone once asked Mother Teresa how on earth she hoped to feed the millions that are starving. She immediately responded by saying, I will feed first one. In other words, we can only do what we can do, but that is better than doing nothing. Now, so far, I could be criticized for seeming to suggest my neighbor is only the poor or the disadvantaged, but that's not the case. My neighbor may be suffering another kind of poverty, the poverty of affluence. To have all the goods this world affords is not necessarily an enrichment. The wealthy may be just as much in need of Christian aid as a poor Eastern villager. Has the former found a personal faith in Christ? Poverty is not to be defined solely in economic terms. Yes, we must always take a person's material needs seriously. Jesus fed the hungry with loaves and fishes. But then he went on to teach them the faith. We need to meet the deeper levels of hunger, such as the hunger to be loved, hunger to be wanted, hunger to be whole. In his gospel, John, in very tough, uncompromising words, reminds us but as Christians, we have a twofold task to accomplish. We have to love God and love our neighbor. Both are as important as each other. We must not do one without the other. As I'm sure you are well aware, we as a diocese are committed to living God's love with the emphasis on 
going deeper into God, transforming communities, making new disciples. This morning we gather here to worship God, hopefully going deeper into God. But that is only part, one part of his commandment. A fortnight today sees the start of Christian Aid Week. I hope and trust that all of us will support that cause. Christian Aid is one specific way that can and does transform communities. Jesus' word, which he asks us to keep, is yes, to love God, but also to love our neighbor. For as C.S. Lewis wrote, next to the blessed sacrament itself, your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your senses. And I am certain that the majority of people who come to faith these days discover their faith through the love and care of a neighbor to a friend who is themselves a Christian. The care of other is surely the best evangelism there can be. Jesus said, keep my word, love God and love one another.